Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is Paul Sheard, author of The Power of Money, which is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Paul has a talent for reducing macroeconomics and markets to their essence. I tend to look at the world anew whenever I speak to him. And Paul is my first guest to make a repeat appearance. Paul, welcome to Brave New World. Delighted to have you back on the show. Thanks very much, Vasant. It's a great pleasure to be back again and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. So I really enjoyed reading your latest book, The Power of Money. After reading it, I couldn't decide whether our financial system is a manifestation of human brilliance, you know, through trial and error, because it does seem brilliant in a sense, the way it's set up, you know, where we're getting it right, or whether there's a sort of a major Achilles heel somewhere and a bigger disruption than GFC or COVID that lies ahead. I, I could see both, sort of both sides of it mm. somehow, but I'm, I'm not sh- quite sure about the latter. And in an earlier episode with my colleague Div, uh, David Yermak on uh, cryptocurrencies, I started by observing that the U.S. has the most trusted financial system in the world, and he reminded me that it actually has the least untrusted one, um, and he corrected me on that. And at the center of it all is money, which few people seem to really understand which is so bizarre when you think about it, isn't it? We're just mm-hmm. sort of immersed with, you know, with money. It's just all around us. Yep. And yet I feel like we don't, it's a slippery kind of concept. How do you think about it? No, I, it's, uh, I agree with that, uh, that way of looking at it. And uh, I sometimes use the uh, analogy of a, a fish in water. Uh, the fish is not really aware of the water. And it's sort of the same thing with, with money. I mean, everybody knows about money. Everybody cares about money. Um, you know, money is intrinsic to everybody's lives, whether you're uber rich or, you know, kind of unfortunately poor. Um, and of course, in, in economics, and I'm, a, you know, an, for my sins, an economist, in economics, of course, money, you know, is, is looms very large and we have, you know, centuries of economic thought about money. But, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book, Vasant, um, as, you know, somebody who started out life as an academic economist and then spent, you know, close to a quarter of a century in financial markets as a kind of observer and analyst and commentator was that I, I felt that you know neither economists nor kind of financial market policy uh, practitioners and policymakers really kind of kind of really explained money well or kind of had their arms around it there's a lot of kind of misunderstandings and kind of myths so that was sort of the motivation for the book to kind of you know sort of kind of explain things a little bit from more of a nuts and bolts perspective and uh, particularly explain kind of where money comes from. But just in terms of how economists usually sort of think and talk about money, it's, you know, anybody who picks up an economics textbook or, you know, any book on on money, and there are plenty of them around, you know, the first thing you uh, read is, well, you know, what is money? And going back to actually um, an economist in the 19th century who kind of first put this down on on paper, uh, Jevons, it will say, well, money is uh, a unit of account. What does that mean? It means that we, you know, you go into the shop and things are quoted in dollars or euros or, or yen or whatever. So that's the way it's all sort of the, the benchmark, the way we measure the, the prices of the goods and services. It's a medium of exchange. It's what you use to engage in uh, economic activity rather than the much more clumsy barter. Uh, and so there's that miracle of money because it simplifies things. Everybody, Everything can just be uh, translated into money and it's money that we exchange for goods and services, not other goods and services. And it's a store of value, which means that you can transfer money through time. It links the present to the future. It allows you to sort of earn money today, but then deploy that money for your con- you know, 
well-being in, in the future. So unit of account, medium of exchange, and store of value. And that's sort of the definition of money. But what's sort of interesting about that definition or way of looking at it is is that it sort of describes the functions that something should have in order to be considered money. Um, it doesn't actually tell you, well, what there it is, is what over it, what, there, yeah, there's yeah. money. It tells you its function, but it still doesn't tell you what it really is. Right, right. And um, so then, of course, the next chapter or the next paragraph in that chapter will be to talk about, well, you know, in prisoner of war camps in the Second World War or whatever, prisoners were using cigarettes as money. Or there'll be little anecdotes about, you know, Pacific Islanders using big stones or seashells as money, um, which, of course, is makes the point that money can be anything that has those three characteristics, but is a little bit kind of, you know, quirky. Um, doesn't tell us much about the modern world. And then what economists do, Vasan, is sort of leap from there, okay, that's what money is, these three functions, to measuring it. And they sort of you get all these M's, M for money, I guess, you know, M0, yeah. kind of base money. M1, very kind of liquid money, money that can be deployed quickly, like cash and demand deposits. And then M2, which sort of is banknotes and demand deposits, checking accounts, but then some other things are thrown in, savings accounts, term deposits, and some maybe money market funds. Then you get this M3 and sometimes M4. Yeah. And then economists sort of get lost in the weeds of, well, where do we draw that line and how do we draw that line? These two kind of different ways of looking at money, the sort of abstract definition and then the kind of nerdy uh, bean counting and uh, measurement issue. But neither of those really tells you much about how this monetary system yeah. actually works, yeah, so, particularly you know, in the contemporary economy. Right. So, you know, one of the things I really found interesting uh, about your book is the fact that it sort of takes on these myths about money. Uh, you know that we we think of money in, in certain ways, and uh, and these are myths, uh, and some of them are really powerful kinds of myths, right? So let's start with them. Mm. You know, the first one being that, you know, banks uh, take in deposits and lend them out, right? I mean, that's the way everyone understands what a bank is, right? Mm. You deposit some money, they've got a bunch of cash, and then they start lending it out, right? And you say, well, that's that's a myth. That's not how it works. Right? So how does it work? Correct. Um- and so that actually has a name that's called the loanable funds theory. And it's very, very sort of deeply entrenched in, in people's kind of psyche and their understanding. The idea that, well, banks, how do banks sort of lend? Well, they take in deposits and then they lend those deposits out to borrowers. And the sort of world goes on. Well, it actually doesn't work that way. So one of the, the sort of the things I do in the book in the first few chapters is to sort of say, well, let's try and answer the question – we know there's all this money in the economy. So in the US, if you looked at M2, which is a kind of a standard definition of money, the US economy is about a $26 trillion economy, and M2 is about $20, $21 trillion. So there's a lot of money sitting there in the economy. So you can ask the question, where did that money come from? You know, not in a historical sense, like the textbooks will talk about the history of money, but like, you know, in the here and now, how does that money get into the economy? And I go through sort of three main ways. You know, you can add a fourth, you can add a fifth, which is cryptocurrencies, and we'll probably get to them later on. But there's sort of three main ways. And the one I start off with is bank credit creation. Bank credit creation is money creation. And if you think at the sort of the very sort of fundamental level of, you know, how do banks operate? If you go into your local bank and you said, I need a $20,000 consumer loan. Um, hopefully, they'll give it to you. You're a good credit. Well, what will happen is the bank will suddenly just essentially press a button and create $20,000 in your account, which is now your asset. You have $20,000 with bank B. And simultaneously, of course, it's creating an asset on its balance sheet, a $20,000 loan claim on Vasant Da. So that's literally how credit creation works. It just, the bank just creates the money. And a lot of people find that very difficult to sort of believe. How could banks just create money? I'm and, sure, and, and sure as, they have to get the money from somewhere. Right. No, actually, that's how money comes into existence 
at that bank credit creation level. Right. And actually, you point out that that's the major source of money creation, right? There are a few others, but this is the the primary source of how money is created, which is sort of really interesting when you think about it, right? That the banks make loans and that's how money is created. Right, right. And again, it's like fish swimming in water because it feels like that can't be right. But again, I would just invite people, probably everybody at one point in their life has taken out a loan or two. Just think about when you walked into that bank or you had that meeting with the bank manager, they said, you've got the loan. What happened? Money appeared in your bank account. That money was not there before. And that money didn't come from somebody else's bank yeah. account. It didn't come from somewhere else. It, it was just, you know, sometimes, again, the term is used ex nihilio. It, it's out of nothing. Now, it doesn't... There's. A, I just want to make an ex, a, a distinction, Vasant, um, or a couple of distinctions are really important. One here is between the level of the individual bank and the banking system as a whole. Um, they're kind of different, the individual and the collective, and the sort of fallacy of compositions and, you know, various uh, things can come into play. So, for the individual bank, it doesn't feel like they're funding or they're, they're creating money in that way. And why is that? Because, of course, when you go into a bank and, and ask for a $20,000 loan, you do it for a reason. You want, you want to use that money. So the first thing you do is you take the money out of the bank, you write a check, and you spend it. And that money transfers to somebody else. So if the, if the bank is relatively small relative to the rest of the economy or the banking system, chances are as soon as they create that $20,000 loan, the $20,000 deposit, which was created when the loan was initiated, but which the bank tends to think of as its funding of the loan, it disappears, goes somewhere else, goes to another bank. It's spent. It's spent and, and you know, it circulates in the economy. Now, it can actually only go essentially into one of two places, either into someone else's bank account as a bank deposit, so it still st stays in the slightly increased money supply, or you could take it out of the bank as, you know, federal notes or bank notes. Um, now, people are doing increasingly less and less of that. Um, so, it's probably going to stay in the banking system as bank deposits. But the bank in question is suddenly going to find itself $20,000 short. So, what's it going to try and do? Well, it's going to try to attract deposits from somewhere else. You know, the bank manager comes in the next morning and says, hey guys, we need $20,000 of deposits to fund this $20,000 loan. The other way in which they'll get that money, you know, the banking system's a complicated animal, so I'm simplifying, but is through the interbank market. And if, if a bank it finds itself $20,000 short, it, if that $20,000 just moved to another bank, then that bank, which didn't initiate a new loan, now finds itself with $20,000 of surplus deposits. So guess what? And that deposit, which for it is a liability, is also an, becomes an asset on the bank's asset side. And what is that asset? That is actually a deposit at the central bank. So it's going to find it's got more deposits at the central bank than it needs, and it will, in all likelihood, lend that money short term to the bank that's $20,000 short. And now this deposit at the central bank is known as a reserve. Is that, that right? Yes. It's an unfortunate term. Yeah. Um, and these reserves play a really important part in the whole monetary system and monetary policy. Yeah. And, 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 and before I read else. your book, I hadn't actually, I mean, I, you know, I've always, I've known what reserves are, I've sort of been right. in finance, but I hadn't really realize their centrality well, in the system. Well, and so the idea of is, is every bank in, again, I'll probably, I, I look at things pretty globally in, in comparative perspective, but often I'll slip into talking about the US and the Fed because it's sort of very familiar territory. Um, but, you know, it's the, the Federal Reserve System. What is the reserve? Well, the reserve is the reserves that banks hold with the central bank, the Federal Reserve. Every bank has a, an account at the Fed in the same way that you know, we all have accounts with commercial banks. They're a little bit different, though, but they are central to the monetary system. Now, they are actually part of what economists call base money or high-powered money. It's sort of base money being this is the, the most fundamental level of the, uh, the monetary system. And um, 
it, it's an unfortunate term, reserves, and different countries call them different things. You know, in I've just been in Australia, they call them exchange settlement accounts. In Japan, they're often called current account balances. It's an unfortunate term, reserves, in the sense that everybody's familiar with foreign exchange reserves. These are very different. If a central bank has foreign exchange reserves, they'll be on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, that is the asset side. And on the right-hand side, that is the liability side, are these other reserves, which are basically commercial bank deposits at the central bank. By the way, you know, one of the things I also realized in reading your book is that you, you sort of take this sort of balance sheet view of the world, which is unusual uh, for economists. So just explain mm. this, right? Because a balance sheet looks very different for an individual than a bank or the banking system as a whole or the central bank or the government, right? Right. So, and, and balance sheets are simple. It's assets and liabilities. So just like take a minute mm. and just educate us about you know what a balance sheet really is and how different it looks at these different levels. Right. So obviously a balance sheet is um, you know assets on one side, liabilities, liabilities and equity on the other side. And because it's a balance sheet, the two sides have to be equal in aggregate. And you're right, economists don't typically pay a lot of attention to balance sheets. You know, if you study economics, you know, you, you do microeconomics and you do macroeconomics and it's all about, you know, individual economic actors and objective functions. You know, consumers want to maximize utility and firms want to maximize profits at least, you know, in the standard model, um, you know, governments have objectives, maybe social welfare maximization. And then you have all these, you know, you have budget constraints. They're very important. You can almost think of a balance sheet as being a little bit more of an articulated form of a budget constraint. But typically, you know, economists leave the, the balance sheets to accountants and they focus on models. And, and so, you know, but models are built up from sort of actors, constraints, equilibrium conditions, and quite abstract and aggregated. And assumptions. Yeah. And assumptions about, about how they behave. And the reason that... Now, there is a, a school of economics which is much more kind of takes balance sheets much more seriously. And it's kind of like a what's called a balance sheet consistent approach. Um, one of the famous economists who worked in this area... Uh, yeah, this area is Wynne Godley. I think he was a Cambridge economist. He passed away a few years ago. And he has an influential book with another a Canadian economist called uh, Lavoie. Very, you know, very good book, I, I, I think, called It's Monetary Economics, something or other. But it's un yeah, economists typically don't focus too much on balance sheets. Why do I fo focus on balance sheets? Well, it sort of comes from my practitioner days as an economist. And just to get a little bit kind of personal about this, I was the go back to March 2001, and I was the chief economist at a uh, for Asia for Lehman Brothers, sitting in Tokyo. And Japan had a banking crisis. Uh, in 1999, it went to zero interest rate policy. And then March 19th, 2001, the Bank of Japan suddenly announced a new policy, which later became known as quantitative easing. And essentially what quantitative easing is, and we may come to this again a little bit later, but a quantitative easing is where the central bank sort of runs out of interest rate ammunition and starts to expand its balance sheet. So suddenly the central bank's balance sheet became an important uh, variable in monetary policy and in the economy. And prior to 2001, most economists looking at the Fed or other central banks didn't even look at the balance sheet per se. And the balance sheet for the central bank consists on the asset side of government bonds and the liability side of reserves and uh, banknotes. Right. So, so very good. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, so the, the central bank's balance sheet, you know, can it can have lots of things on the asset side, usually by law or by custom. Uh, it is, generally speaking, restricted to government debt securities, government bonds, treasuries, JGBs, etc. On the on the right hand side, the liability side, it has those commercial bank deposits called reserves, bank notes in circulation, you know, the Benjamins and bank notes like that. A third one, which is really quite important, uh, but is very underappreciated, is government deposit account itself. So the government. Now, the central bank in the modern world is part of the government, but it is also the banker 
to the government. And so the government has an account at the central bank. And the central bank typically operates as the fiscal agent of the government. So when the treasury is is collecting taxes and, and writing checks and issuing bonds and doing all of this fiscal stuff, it's all happening through the account that it has at the central bank, say the Fed in this country. And then what else? There's a few other items, but and then there's sort of the capital or the equity. So the Fed's kind of sitting in the middle between the commercial banking system and the government and the treasury, right? So it's playing this really important role between the two. Exactly. And it's, it, again, and, and one of the themes in my book is to talk about bank money creation, uh, sorry, money creation overall as being really some kind of partnership between the the, the government through the the central bank in particular, and the banking system. But also, if you start looking at bank balance sheets and how fiscal policy, how the government relates to the central bank and how these fiscal operations work, you start to realize that monetary and fiscal policy, these sort of two arms of macroeconomic policy, are really kind of intertwined. And we don't see it that way because we've created or an institution has developed in the last 50 years or so of the independent technocratic central bank. So what do you mean when you say they are intertwined, right? So fiscal is all about like how you spend, how you tax. Right. So, so for example, if you looked at those reserves, those reserves – what, what, what is their role in the economy? Okay, banks have reserves at the central bank. You have to kind of have and this... These, and these reserves, by the way, are assets for the bank and liability exactly. for the central bank. Exactly. So it's money. It's, yeah, money. it's money that the central bank has created. And those reserve levels, they go up and down. And the, they play a really important role in monetary policy. Now, when we have this discussion, Vasant, almost have to talk about two different regimes – pre-financial crisis, GFC, global financial crisis, and post, if you like, pre-QE world and post-QE world. If you could just bear with me for for a moment. So if you go back into the the old days, uh, pre-2008, the Fed, first of all, important institutional detail. And again, the more you get into this sort of stuff, you realize that like little institutional rules that are you know, man-made, not God-given, yeah. very important in, 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 in the way the system works. So up until 2008, in most countries, and certainly in the US, those reserves did not uh, pay interest. They were a, kind of like an electronic version of banknotes, but they were only issued to the banks, not to individuals. Banknotes don't earn interest. Right. They just have this monetary value. Reserves like that. Now, why is that important? If you go back to uh, September 2007, the federal funds rate was about five and a quarter percent pre-financial crisis. Now, how was it five and a quarter percent? Now, the, I, I want to tie this to, mm. the, to what you referred to earlier, you know, where that $20 loan was created and the bank finds mm. itself short, it can borrow, right, reserves from someone who has excess. That's the interest rate they pay to borrow the reserves. Is that right? So, 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 all, the interbank all, rate. so the most important, again, the way the monetary system and the way the whole financial system works, the most important sort of financial price in the economy is, and again, I'll talk US for the moment, the federal funds rate. Right. And the federal funds rate, so at the moment it's, uh, what is it, five and a half to five and three quarters, I think it is. It's been going up, up, yeah, up, yeah. up. Amazing how quickly actually, it's gone up. And it's pretty much back to yeah. where it was at the peak in 2007. That's right. And that... Federal funds uh, rate, what is it? Well, it's the rate at which one bank lends to another in the, what do they lend? The reserves that they have at the Fed to one another in the overnight market. So it's it's a one day lending rate. And that is the target of interest rate policy. So the Fed now is saying, we've set interest rates that call it five and a half percent. Now in the old days, those reserves didn't have any interest attached to them. So if you, you can think through a, a sort of an, a, a, a mental exercise, which would be to say, well, there's a thing, it gets a little bit more complicated. There's a thing called minimum reserve requirements. Central bank, uh, sorry, commercial banks have to hold reserves, at a certain level of reserves over a month, period of a month, 
at the central bank, at the Fed. Why is that? Well, it goes back to this idea that, well, you know, the depositors might come in one day and take out their money. There needs to be cash on reserve, right? So the Federal Reserve and most central banks say to the banks, okay, you have to hold a certain fraction or an amount of money on reserve equivalent to a certain fraction of your deposits. Now, if you are a bank and you're not getting any uh, interest on those reserves, but you need to hold a certain amount, you want to hold exactly the right amount. Now, here's another little um, factor. The, the minimum. You want to hold the minimum, you want to hold at least the minimum, but yeah. not too, not above the minimum. Right. Maybe a tiny bit, mm-hmm. epsilon. Yeah. Now, here's another really important kind of point. The, the central bank controls the aggregate amount of reserves in the banking system. It doesn't control how much each individual bank holds at any point in time, but it controls the aggregate amount. How does it do that? Well, if it wakes up one day and there are too many reserves in the banking system, how could that happen? Now, this is where it gets to answer your question. What if the government was running a budget deficit? Well, running a budget de- deficit creates reserves in the banking system. Now that, how does that happen? Well, running a budget deficit means the government is writing more checks into the economy than it's taking out in taxes. And part of the place that that money shows up is an increase in reserves. Well, if there are too many reserves relative to the minimum required amount, that is going to put downward pressure on the federal funds rate. Yeah. Because banks will say, I'm getting zero interest on these funds. The federal funds rate is supposed to be 5.5%. That means I can go and lend to another bank at 5.5%. But you can't because nobody wants to borrow these excess reserves. So it's a concomitant, a corollary of reserves not being paid interest and the central bank targeting a positive interest rate that it not provide too many reserves. The logic works in the other direction. What if the Federal Reserve left the banking system as a whole short of reserves? Then every bank would be looking around saying, oh, I'm short of reserves, I need to borrow from somewhere. They would go out and try to borrow. That would force the interest rate up. up. And so essentially, cut a long story short, and here's a slightly long story, apologize for that. Um, Pre-financial crisis, the Federal Reserve had to maintain, any central bank, had to maintain the reserves through its operations, asset sales, asset purchases, different operations, and move that, I call it like a water line, the water in the bucket to the, just to the line, not below and not above. So in the course of giving that explanation, I brought in fiscal policy, fiscal operations, spending, taxing, bond issuance, all of these things operating through the the government's deposit account at the central bank are also influencing the level of reserves. And it's the level of reserves and the interest that is paid on those reserves, used to be zero, which is essentially monetary policy. So that's kind of one way in which they're intertwined. QE is another one because now we get to QE. Um, Now the central bank goes out and starts buying a lot of government debt securities, treasuries, JGBs, you know, buns, whatever, right. so and expands bu- its balance sheet, that's creating reserves by one part of the government buying the debt of another part. So again, monetary and fiscal policy start to be intertwined again. Thanks for that, Paul. That's, that's a lot of like really intricate stuff, you know, simplified. So the other thing you talk about, you know, coming back to myths, right, is that we're running these huge deficits Uh, And you actually say, well, that's a good thing, which most people would sort of do a double take and say, what? Like, how can it be a good thing to run these deficits? And yet you point out that that's yet another way to create money. It's a good thing. So why are deficits a good thing? And while I'm asking this question, I want to throw in a big one, which Hmm. is that this, this belief that we are leaving future generations with a huge amount of debt, right, that is going to have to be paid back. And one of the things you point out in your book is that this is a special kind of debt that never needs to be paid back, right? That's what banknotes are. And it sort of got me to thinking, what does it mean for me to be worth, let's say, $100,000, right? So if I've got $100,000 in my account, what does that really mean, right? 
because I view that as an asset. Mm. Like I've, you know, I've got this cash, it's yep. an asset, but it's really sort of a, it's an IOU, right? So if I literally take that cash out of my bank account and I hold it in banknotes, it's the central government basically saying, yes, uh, Vasant, we owe you $100,000. You worked all your life. You've accumulated $100,000. It's an IOU. But I can't really go to the government and say, well, give me something in exchange for that, like gold. Mm-hmm. You know, they're exactly. just going to tell me to go away and do something else yep. with the money, right? Mm. So, And this is another sort of thing you point out, that that this is a liability, but it never needs to be paid, mm-hmm. which just sounds bizarre on the face of it. Right. Yeah, lot, a lot in that question, but that's really Im- important stuff. So, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily that government deficits just you know are a good thing per se, but rather that they're not necessarily a bad thing. And the reason for that is that <clears throat> government, the government deficit means the government is creating more money by its spending. You know, how does the government spend it? It 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 actually uh, hires people. It buys products. It buys missiles. Uh, it writes checks for social security recipients and unemployment and all sorts of things. So it's dispersing money into the economy, but it's also taking money out through essentially through taxation. And it, most countries, most of the time, governments are actually putting more money into the economy than they're withdrawing. And so one way to think about the budget deficit is it is actually one of the ways in which money gets into the economy and we need money in the economy. Um, The very first words in my book are from the cabaret uh, musical, money makes the world go round. And that's that's true. We need money in the economy uh, to help economic activity and to connect the economy through time. So from that point of view, we shouldn't just, you know, you have these kind of some people think, well, the government should balance its budget. Well, why? Well, because, you know, households have to do that. So why shouldn't the government? Well, the government is not a household. And I'm not the first person to point this out. There's a thing called the the household myth. Um, you know, most recently, Stephanie Kelton in her book, The Deficit Myth, has, has pointed this out very, uh, you know, argued this case very persuasively. So we, so we have to disabuse ourselves of the idea that somehow a government deficit per se is bad. Now, when... What's wrong with a budget budget deficit? There's just a couple of quick reasons you might not like big budget deficits. And of course, a budget deficit is a flow and that flow turns into a stock over time and the stock is the stock of government debt. Now, this word debt, I think, is a misnomer, but we're kind of stuck with it for the moment. So, government debt. Well, is it a misnomer because we don't simultaneously think of it as an asset to someone else? Well, the, it's so, government debt, but if right. I own a bond, then it's an asset to me exactly. and I pass it down so to, getting back to my balance kids. Sheets, yeah. Getting back to balance sheets, yeah. uh, government debt is on the liability side of the government's ba- uh, balance sheet, if you right. like. And for the people who own the debt, it's, it's an, an asset. asset. Yeah. And so what I, one of the things, again, economists don't historically treat government bonds as money. And one of the things I, I sort of argue in my book is, look, to really understand this system, we should think, just think of government bonds as money. Um, now, why don't we think of government bonds as money? Because here's again, another kind of <laughs> point that let me convince you that governments can create money by running a budget deficit. We know from Milton Friedman and you know, others that too much money chasing not enough goods and services will lead to inflation. And there's a famous quote that Milton Friedman has, which is only half quoted. And the the rest of the quote is essentially to say because, where he says, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. The rest of the sentence says because, in the sense that too much money chasing too few goods and services will lead to inflation. So if we have a thing called the government... So is that what sort of joins the monetary economy with the real physical economy? So uh, that quote is a little bit... Again, it's only ever half quoted. Everybody says, oh, well, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. But that's only half the sentence. It's a monetary phenomenon in the sense that money creation... Money is purchasing power. When that purchasing power, if too much purchasing power is created and is unleashed into an economy, you have to ask the question, what is the capacity of the economy to absorb that purchasing power 
that is to create goods and services that are being demanded without leading to a shortage. Too much money, not enough goods and services, you get inflation. So exactly, uh, I think Milton Friedman's point there is much misunderstood. It sort of sounds like it's just purely monetary. No, it's monetary and real economy meeting one another, causing inflation. So now we understand the point that yes, governments running too big a budget deficit can lead to inflation. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of political temptation to do that. If the government can just create money, then they will tend to do that. Because of that fact, in the second half of the 20th century in particular, the kind of institutional innovation uh, arose of saying, we, the government, had better put shackles on our ability to create this money. So let me just interrupt you there, Paul, because this is a point that just completely blows my mind. And uh, I, I think other people will find it strange as well, right? That, you know, you point out that governments don't issue bonds to finance their activity, right? And nor do they tax you to finance their activity necessarily, right? So the mm -hmm. purpose of taxation is not to finance their activities because they can do so in many other more effective kind of ways. And, and but, but I found this sort of really interesting that actually bonds are issued in a sense as a way for the government to sort of shackle itself, mm. right? Exactly. Which, which sort of really blows my mind. Mm. It actually reminds me of what James Robinson talks about in his uh, book where he talks about the need to sort of shackle the Leviathan, Right, to, right. To, to not give it too much power. Mm. And you, you, you're talking about exactly the same phenomenon right. as an economist, right? And, and what you're saying is that governments issue bonds to shackle themselves. And that just sort of blows my mind. And, and they issue bonds to do to, to, as part of a system that shackles them. So in other words, if you start from, from the, the, the premise or the observation that governments, you know, left unchecked, can create money, Uh, just in the same way that banks can create money. And that used to happen. And that right? used to happen. And we've had many yeah. episodes in history where they that went out of control and we had hyperinflation. Yeah. So that was the lesson of the 20th century. And that that that, that the learning from that le lesson was codified in institutional arrangements. And one of the institutional, the key institutional arrangement is to create within the government a central bank that almost acts... Well, it, it is sort of supposedly independent of the government. It's part of the government. It's inside the government. But it's acting a little bit like your banker would act. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, you know, kind yeah. of tough, tough right. messages, tough medicine here. That's right. Yeah. And in particular, so where do bonds come into this? Um, there's a couple of things which are important, institutional aspects. One is I mentioned that the government has an account at the central bank effectively means it has an account with itself, its own bank. But it cannot allow, typically the law says, or, or certainly convention stipulates, that the government cannot allow that account to go into overdraft. Imagine if it could. I mean, it's its own account. It doesn't yeah. really matter. It's just an accounting number. Right. And just ran a big budget deficit, need some more spending. Yeah, no, press some more buttons, yeah. you know, spend just more money. Keep et cetera, creating et money. Yeah. Now, that would be creating money in the banking system, bank deposits, yeah. because the people who are receiving those checks or remittances from the government, yeah. that's accumulating as bank deposits. And that will, will be accumulating on the central bank's balance sheet as these reserves, which are the accounts that the, cent that the banks have with them. So all this money is being created. So there has to be... So There has to be some check put on that. And one of the checks, the shackles is to create this rule that says the government has to keep its account at the central bank in balance. A second rule is that typically central banks are not able to buy the bonds issued by the government directly. They can buy them indirectly in the market. Why is that important? Well, let's say that instead of running an overdraft, every time that the government wanted to spend some money, it just rang up the central bank and said, oh, buy $100 billion dollars of bonds. The central bank buys the bonds, now the government has $100 billion dollars in its bank account and it spends it. So again, not allowing the central bank to purchase the bonds issued by the government itself is a way of putting shackles on the government's ability to spend 
uh, you know, without limit. Yeah. So that's really fascinating. So what that assumes, I guess, is that there are enough bonds in the market for the central bank to buy up in the first place that are held by individuals or institutions. So I guess it assumes that there's an adequate supply of, because they can't buy directly from the government, so they have to buy it right. from the market. And then, so and that's the check and there balance. There usually is. There yeah. usually is. So the third aspect of sort of the, the shackling and how do these bonds... But, it's by, not... by, by the way, and the, I might be getting like mm-hmm. way ahead here, mm-hmm. and maybe we can come back to this. So is that sort of the ultimate limitation of QE, that it's constrained by the sort of capacity... Uh, of you know uh, that that's specified in terms of like what's the total value of buyable assets in out there sense, in the market? Uh, exactly. I mean, the central bank typically, when they do QE, yeah. buys treasuries, let's say, or JGBs, bunds, gilts. Um, in theory, you know, they they wouldn't do this because it would you know they wouldn't be consistent with their monetary policy decision making and we can kind of come to that um but in theory they could buy all of the financial a- all of the government debt yeah. they could then buy all the financial assets right they could buy all the real assets yeah. what would be the point of doing that though they would just be kind of liquefying and creating essentially uh, you know they would own every asset in the universe and right. they would have created a huge amount of money yeah. but in principle you know they can they can they can do that sort of thing but let me just come back to bonds because it's such an important point that you raise, Basant, which is the the whole idea of the government issuing bonds, it looks like they're doing that to borrow money in order to spend. It's actually the other way around. The shackling is to say that the government, when it creates these budget deficits, has to face a situation where it looks and feels like to the government that it has to borrow the money that it's actually going to create. Because let's say the government wakes up one day and says, we plan to run a budget deficit of $100. Well, we're going to need to raise $100 in order to spend that $100. So they issue $100 worth of bonds, then they run the $100 budget deficit. It's What happens net? $100 of bonds is created. If they hadn't issued the bonds, if they'd just done this through the central bank and run an overdraft or, you know, mm-hmm. central bank had bought the bonds, yeah. there would have been $100 of money created. So instead of creating the money, they're turning that money through bond issuance into a thing called a bond. Yeah. But what is a bond? In my view, it's just another form of money. It's another form that that money takes. If you have a $100 bond, as you said before, you have an asset and you might keep it as a bond most of the time, but then one day you say, I I need to go on a holiday, I need some cash, you'll sell that bond for money and you'll spend the money. So it's just a bond is really just one step removed from being very deployable money, but it is effectively money. So to come back to this point about the grandchildren and everything else, the way to think about bonds is not that the government at a very fundamental level needs to borrow money. No, it creates money when it runs a budget deficit. But that's a problem for society because we need to put some shackles, some restraints on the ability, on the tendency, the proclivity of the government to do that. And one of the ways of doing that is this independent central bank and also essentially saying the government has to turn its the money that it creates into something that has a pay-by-date attached to it and makes it look like it has to repay that money. Now, treasuries are coming up. The repayment dates are coming up all the time. What happens? They just get refinanced into new bonds and the world goes on happily enough. You know, sort of coming back to, you know, what I mentioned right at the outset, is there like an Achilles heel to this system does it require a degree of trust? And you know, one of the things you sort of open with is a quote by Harari, I think, you know, because he has a chapter in Sapiens about money. Well, just on, yeah, I think I think I know where you're going. So Yuval uh, Noah Harari, yeah. the Israeli anthropologist, historian, yeah. his book Sapiens has a chapter on money. And I, as an economist, kind of really quite like that chapter. Yeah, yeah. And, and you talk about you know money having really strong network effects, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 you point out that the purpose of taxation 
is not for the government to finance its operations, but more like as a mechanism to create demand for money, right? So it's created demand for money, the strong network effects. Does the system hinge on just us trusting? Who do we, there's a, the, you know, the, we've got to trust something, someone. What, what are we trusting in this whole system to not sort of fall apart? Well, I think we are trusting ourselves. We are trusting the Leviathan, as you called it, the, the Hobbes. And I actually have a quote of Hobbes in there as well. You know, the, the government stands behind the monetary system. The government stands behind money. And, you know, it's the, the monetary system is, is quite a complex kind of convoluted thing. So we've talked about banks creating money. Well, who gives them the license to do that? The government. Um, banks operate under banking licenses for a good reason. That's a huge exorbitant privilege. Now, governments also create money through budget deficits, turned into bonds, etc. Now, there is a difference between those two kinds of money. You know, if you, if you went into the banking system and you sort of said, oh, there's a, there's a b- deposit that Vazant has of $100 at, you know, whatever, Citibank. Not giving a plug, but anyway. Um, well, you wouldn't know just by looking at that $100 where that $100 came from. Did that $100 originally come from bank credit creation? Did it come from the government running a budget deficit? Did it come from the central bank doing QE? Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately, yeah. where did that, yeah. where did, how did it come into existence? We, no way of telling. Money's fungible. But there's a difference between those things. When the banks create money through credit creation, the premise is they're going to get that money back. Yeah. The loan has to be repaid. Right. But you know the economy is always expanding, and, and yet at the level of the government, that 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 liability never needs right. to be repaid. Well, this is the key difference. Right? This is the key difference between yeah. the, the, the bank money creation and government money creation. Bank, the economy is up until now essentially continually expanding, so there's always more credit creation than credit destruction. What do I mean by credit destruction? People repaying their loans right. that destroys money. Right. Um, but and taxation pretty, also destroys money. It does. Right? So those are the two mechanisms. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, one, so, so, but that's the premise is the money is created, but the money will be destroyed. Right. Government money creation doesn't work like that. There doesn't have to be any premise that that money is ever repaid. How can I convince you of that? You mentioned uh, fiat money before, a $20 bill. If I pull out a $20 bill, you'll see Andrew Jackson's mug on it, his face on it. So it's $20. A $20 bill costs about five cents to make. But we accept that it has $20 of value. And that's the trust element. That is, when you go to a shop and you use that $20, the shopkeeper takes it because they regard it as having $20 of value. They don't say, Vasant, I'm not taking this $20 bit of paper. It only costs five cents to create. No, society collectively sort of agrees to treat that. Yes, and that's where I like um, Yuval Noah Harari's point. He has a point that money, like many other institutions in society, exists in our shared imaginations. We all agree suspend our <laughs> disbelief. That's and just mind-boggling. It. That's just mind-boggling it, when you it think is right. about it, right? It is right. So, um, so that $20, why, why do I mention a $20 banknote? $20 banknote, as you said before, that never has to be repaid. Right. If you took that $20 banknote to the Federal Reserve, it says Federal Reserve Note. It's, a, it's an IOU of the right. Federal Reserve. And if somehow they let you in, Liberty Street, and you got in there and you say, I want my $20 back, they have a lot of gold in their vault. They're not going to give you any. They're going to turn around and say, here it is, and they'll give you the $20 bill back. Yeah. Or maybe they give you $21 bills. Right, right. That's the notion of fiat money. So we should all understand banknotes, which is a liability of the government, never has to be repaid. Well, government... Bonds, but for me, it's a claim. It's a right? claim. It's, it's, it's a, a, and, and society and as you, I, is right. going to is going to assign twenty dollars right. of value to that. Now, right. just to jump a little bit, that's why, the, <laughs> you know, having a, a a credible monetary and fiscal system is so important to maintain the public's trust in that system. So, why is it that the U.S. has the least untrusted 
financial system in the world, right? Which is where we started. What what what's so special about the well, U.S. financial yeah, system? Yeah, I, I didn't say that myself. Yeah, yeah. But but let's but take let, it let's as, take that as true. Another way of saying that would be to say that the U.S. is the dominant reserve currency in the world, and I, and that comes from that not there haven't been that many so-called reserve currencies in the history of the world, at least in the last few centuries. Um, yeah, I think the Dutch Guilda was at one point, believe it or not, the obviously British sterling, and then post-Second World War, the US dollar became the kind of dominant reserve currency. And there are, you mentioned network effects before. There are kind of, you know, in international finance and trade and invoicing and whatnot, there are advantages to having like, let's, let's all coordinate and, and use one currency to a large extent, and that's the US dollar. So why do we sort of trust the US dollar? Well, it's, it, it, it sort of was, and depending on how you measure it, still is the largest economy in the world. It's got the d- huge capital markets. It's got you know, pretty good institutions. I think they're coming under attack at the moment um, and the question marks are being raised, but it has the rule of law and, and everything else. It has the biggest military in the world, that kind of helps. Um, so, you know, it, it has a lot, a, lot, a lot going for it, but it's not, not God-given. But can I just come back to, again, explaining why governments don't have to uh, repay their debt. <clears throat> Think of QE for a moment. Let me just come back to QE. One, one mental experiment would be to say that um, what if the Fed decided to buy up all government treasuries. And one of the things I point out in the book is that quantitative easing is actually a debt refinancing operation of the overall government or the consolidated government where the central bank issues reserves to the banking system. By purchasing the bonds, treasuries, let's say they purchase them all, dollar for dollar, they're going to create reserves in the banking system. Now, those reserves, now at the moment, there's quite a lot of them because the, the, the Fed has been doing QE. Right. Before four point some trillion? Something like that. And the Fed's balance sheet at the moment is probably about half, eight and a half trillion dollars. Without QE, it probably would be more like two-ish, maybe a little bit less, around two. So, there's about six trillion dollars of QE has been added to the system. Now, the, the normal argument against, hold on a minute, Paul, I mean, what you said is crazy. If the Fed bought all of the government debt securities, wouldn't that cause inflation? Well, yes, if it, probably if it didn't do it the right way. But one of the really important things that's happened in the world, Vasant, and I mentioned you have to look at pre-QE and post-QE, is that now most the Fed and most central banks have acquired the legal ability to pay interest on reserves. So if the central bank bought up all the bonds in existence but was not paying interest on reserves, the interest rate would be zero. And that would be very, very stimulatory from a monetary policy point of view and, you know, we'd have inflation. And, you know, I argued before the whole reason, a large reason for setting up the system the way it's been set up is to put shackles on the government so we don't get inflation. And that relates to the trust point. If if people thought... It, it also relates to sort of having a rational sort of connection between the monetary and the real economy. Right. right. And by rational, I mean uh, something that's uh, sort in of... Balance. Right. They need right. to be in balance. I mean, in yeah. They need to kind of be in balance. Mm-hmm. Um I use the bathtub analogy. You can think of the the real economy as being the bathtub. But it's a funny bathtub because it's expanding all the time as the economy is growing. And that bathtub needs to have enough water in it. Not too much water, and but enough water. That's the money in the system. And as the bathtub expands, you've got to make sure that enough water is coming into the bathtub to keep the water up to the water line, but not overflowing. So that's, again, monetary and fiscal policy is, is helping to do that. But getting back to the, the, the QE point, now that banks... So what's the Fed doing at the moment? The Fed has got an interest rate of 55 to 5 and 3 quarter percent, I think it is, the latest rate hike. They're paying essentially 5.5% on the reserves that central banks have with them. So they're paying a lot of money to the banking system to keep the federal funds rate at around about 5.5%. In other words, the reserves at the central bank 
created by QE are functioning as a kind of quasi treasury bond. That's where they came from. The Fed created those reserves by retiring treasuries and refinancing them into reserves. reserves. And they can do that and maintain monetary control at the same time because they can pay interest on reserves. So this ability of the central banks to pay interest on reserves has allowed them to separate their balance sheet decision, how big a balance sheet to have, how many reserves to create, from their interest rate decision. This is really, really important. So why is all this important? Well, those reserves are just like banknotes in the sense that they never have to be returned. They never have to be repaid. They just are. They're just money sitting in the system. And if you think that is too much money and it's, it's potentially inflationary, the Fed is, is countering that or neutralizing that effect by raising the interest rate. It holds all the cards. Now, so that's another way of, of understanding that actually the government doesn't need to repay the debt. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to worry about it. And there are just quickly two reasons why you or I or anybody might be worried about... That's fascinating. It doesn't need to repay its debt, but it needs to worry about right. it. <laughs> this is much misunderstood. Yeah. Because, you know, when, when people like me have this conversation, there's a tendency to say, oh, the guy's crazy. I mean, he's saying that deficits don't matter. Or debt doesn't matter. No, 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 I never said that. I'm just saying it doesn't matter because it's a burden on our grandchildren. Right, that's the, it doesn't that, matter. That's the myth. That's, that's, that's the, the myth. myth. It doesn't yeah. matter in the sense that, oh my God, we're going to have to repay this stuff. <clears throat> They're kind of big picture, two reasons why you might worry about it. One is very deeply philosophical and political in some ways, which is if we're talking about a, a lot of debt out there, we're talking about a, a, an economy where the Leviathan has got pretty big. That is, if, if, if you have a big government and it's doing a lot of it, you know, economic activity and it's pumping a lot of money into the economy and it has a big government sector doing a lot of transfers, fiddling around with the tax system, you know, from a philosophical point of view, depending on where you are on the economic and political spectrum, you might say, that's not good. We don't want such a big government. Again, not because you have to repay the debt, but simply... You know, you might like markets much more, much more. You might like free enterprise much more. You, you might think the government's part of the problem, not the solution. And I think the problem that a lot of the Republicans have is they kind of, they don't like big government, but the, the reason that they glom on to, just to get, I don't want to get too political, but when I'm listening to the debate, I'm trying to process it myself and I'm saying, the Republicans will tend to say, oh, debt, you know, burden on our grandchildren, therefore we have to cut down on the deficit. They're actually using the wrong argument. The other argument that you might be very concerned about the level of government debt and deficits, particularly projected into the future, is that is purchasing power and too much purchasing power can cause inflation. So you may have to withdraw some of the government debt, some of that money from the economy to bring that water line in the bath down to where it needs to be. So you can have too much government debt in the sense of too much purchasing power because it's inflationary. <coughs> that's hardly rocket science. I mean, that's like, yeah, government prints too much money, you get inflation. But that's the reason, not the, the idea that somehow this stuff has to be repaid per se. And it's a race between too much purchasing power and do we have enough capacity to produce goods and services? Well, I'm a little bit... More, sang more sort of relaxed about this because the history of the world for the last couple of hundred years in particular has been incredible technological innovation. And so, yeah, we may end up having created too much purchasing power when our grandchildren inherit those assets, the government debt as assets. But on the other hand, we might have a much more productive economy mm -hmm. by that point and much more ability to produce the goods and services that can absorb that purchasing power. Right, because what we don't talk about also uh, that goes simultaneously with this debt is the tremendous stock of knowledge and, and science and know-how that comes with it that has the capacity to generate sort of future wealth. Exactly, exactly. So, by, by mm. the way, you know, we've talked about inflation a few times, several times, uh, and the sort of uh, 
need to keep it under control. There's a sort of 2% magical number, right? That seems to be what central banks shoot for. What's magical about 2% and its role in trust? So there's nothing magical per se, um, but it's the number that uh, that sort of central bankers are lighted on. And it, where does, so where does it come from? The idea, first of all, what central banks, go back to basics for a minute here, what the central banks are supposed to be doing with um, you know, inflation targeting is they're trying to achieve price stability. Now, price stability doesn't mean individual prices, but some sort of overall cost of living, the, the sort of the consumer price index. And so this is actually another kind of little bit of a interesting thing. So, you know, most economists and central bankers uh, want to have m- markets setting prices, but they want to control the overall price level. That is, if you like, the net effect of the millions and millions of prices that are moving in the economy. In some sense, they want to have their cake and eat it too. It's an interesting thing. But they like price stability. Now, you might say, well, hold on a minute. So, why do you want that? The, the normal, uh, one, of the, one of the key arguments is, it comes back to this trust point, that what happens when you have inflation? 20%, 50%, 100%. Well, that's eroding your purchasing power. So if you know if you've, you've you, you're you know you're an individual or a family you're saving some amount of your money for the future for your retirement when you're no longer working and you're relying on your savings to finance your retirement well if you have 100% inflation you know your life's work of sweat and tears just went half of it went down the drain so part of the sort of social contract the government that can create this money and indirectly regulate the banking system's money creation is that we will preserve the purchasing power of money through time. We'll do that by ensuring the price level is stable over time. Now, it doesn't literally mean... You might say, well, hold on a minute. Isn't that 0% inflation? And then you get into this very nuanced uh, economic argument about, well, actually, there are various reasons why you might want the actual rate of inflation not to be zero, but to be a slightly positive number, and let's call it 2%. Um, Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that the published official uh, consumer price indexes and different indices tend to overstate the inflation rate. And so economists say, well, let's build in a little bit of a buffer of maybe one, one and a half percent at least. Another reason kind of gets back to this, what central banks do, that by having a, a positive inflation rate, say 2%, there, that gives them a little bit of a buffer. So that means their federal funds rate will be that 2% plus a little bit more maybe to uh, accommodate like real growth in the economy. So it might be say, you know, three, three and a half percent, something like that. Federal funds rate in equilibrium, steady state. So if you get into a recession, that allows them to cut the interest rate, the nominal interest rate, and potentially stimulate the economy. And the argument is, well, if you if they were operating at zero, they wouldn't have that sort of two percent buffer built into their interest rate target that they could use when they really need to use it. It's, it's a very yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's a very kind of nerdish kind of argument, and there's a couple of others, yeah. price you know, wage rigidity, psychological stuff. So, uh, so, so, I, so, but just on that point, yeah. but there's now so that's where the two percent comes from. But it's very very arbitrary, and apparently, mm-hmm. like actually, Alan Greenspan was sort of the one with I think Janet Yellen at some FOMC meeting a few decades ago that came up with this. But I think there's some famous quote where Greenspan is quoted as saying, "Well, why two percent? It's like a nice round number, and it's low enough." that people don't notice it. So if you're running 2% inflation, the price level will sort of double, but it'll do that over a 35-year period or something. It's generational. People don't really notice it. 2% is the number that is above zero, but low enough that people don't really notice it in terms of their overall right. standard of living. But there's a debate at the moment, Vasan. This rears its ugly head, and I do think it's a slightly ugly head every now and again of, well, maybe we should, this Fed should raise that and it should be 3% or 4%. I know, or I was something. reading that actually in the I, Wall Street Journal the other that. day that, that, again, concerns about debt. So I want to come back to something you said mm. uh, earlier about, you know, shackling the Leviathan and that... Some of these sort of uh, 
things have become codified, right? And I, I noticed, uh, you know, that word sort of st stuck with me. And I was thinking, so we've gone through a lot of trial and error over the centuries, right, at sort of honing this economic system, building trust. And, you know, occasionally things go wrong. You have these bubbles, crises, all that kind of stuff. And we've had this sort of crypto movement that started around the great financial crisis. And before we sort of get into crypto, what I want to ask is, in the long run, right, let, let, let's say we sort of do this trial and error and we sort of get comfortable that we have the tools to keep inflation at 2%. We have the tools through QE to, you know, run at almost full employment, right? So let's say we get comfortable that we've sort of honed in on the right sort of tools and the public has sort of uh, trusts that the system actually works, right? That these tools work, mm -hmm. the economists know what they're doing. <laughs> Is that... Sometimes, it, sometimes a generous assumption. <laughs> well, so that's what I was going to get at, right? So does that mean that sort of in the long run, the Fed would be an algorithm, right? W would that be sort of the ultimate sort of systematic shackle mm. Or is that mm. uh, or is that equally scary as a bunch of economists mm. at the Fed trying to sort of figure out what to do? Right. And, and by the way, you know, you talk about the fact that this job of the humans at the Fed is complicated by two lags, right? That you can change monetary policy, you can do QE, and so you cause an immediate change in the conditions in the financial system, but there's a lag in terms of how it sort of manifests itself in the economy, and then there's another lag in terms of like the information coming back to the Fed to act on, right? So mm. there's a sort of double lag, and you have people sort of second-guessing all kinds of things. Yeah. Is this ultimately sort of replaceable by an algorithm that sort of has figured out these lags? Uh, especially as an, as the economy gets more and more sort of information based. Mm. I mean, to, to go right to the chase there. I mean, the word ultimately, I think, is important. I think the answer is yes. Um, and I'll take my cue on AI from you, Vasant. But if you can convince me that a lot of this AI, you know, it's just opened the Pandora's box, and we're going to we're going to be able to do all sorts of things in the future. Monetary policy is ripe for the plucking. Maybe let me just come back to that point in a moment. But let me sort of <clears throat> come to the, the uh, kind of the first part of the question, I think, which is this, you know, is do we have almost, have we solved the problem? Do we have the perfect system? And I think the answer is, is, is no. And, and again, as somebody who kind of has been steeped in this stuff for a, a few decades now, um, what is sort of interesting about the system we have today is you kind of step back from it and you have bank credit creation and you have government deficits and you have monetary policy and you have macro prudential policy, which is sort of a response to the financial crisis. The idea that, you know, a group of regulators in, in Washington can look over the whole macro economy and financial system and see if there are excesses building up and turn some knobs, etc. Um, the idea that we've somehow, and we've got the separation of monetary and fiscal policy, so we've kind of got some pretty good shackles in place. So it's, it's sort of done and dusted. Um, it keeps proving to be wrong. <laughs> and I think it's, it's sort of wrong for a good reason that there is, you know, there is no ultimate, like, perfect solution here. We can just try and, you know, get better and better and tweak the system. But the problem, you know, when in the here and now is, of course, you know, we have people in these institutions, you know, we have a chairman of the Fed, we have a secretary of the treasury, we have all these people in these institutions. And these are very conservative institutions. And, you know, we've mentioned trust a few things. You know, you don't want to be cavalier. You want to sort of project an image of, you know, competence and you know, I'm in control here. And, you know, we just had the Jackson Hole, you know, uh, Jackson Hole, um, Wyoming, annual conference of global central bankers hosted by the Fed and it's the mecca of monetary policy and you know, the whole financial markets and the whole world media, financial media are focused on this. Um, these people are almost become godlike in, you know, a word from, from, from Jay Powell can change financial markets and change the world. Pardon me. And you say, really? Where did this power come from? So one of the points that I've sort of made over the last few years is that this is not a perfect 
optimized steady state system or institutional framework. We need to keep revisiting it and say, hold on a minute, we've solved one problem, but we've created another. This idea that, you know, central banks are being overburdened, you know, now they've got climate policy and they've got ESG, they've got all these things are being loaded onto the, the central bank. So that's the first point to make, that there's no, you know, the system is it still needs to be looked at and I think is you know, ripe for major reforms and maybe just park that point in case, unless you want to come back to it. Now getting back to the, but you know, here we are at the moment where the job essentially is given to the Fed and I think the, the conversation about artificial intelligence is kind of intriguing and you know, none of this is going to happen tomorrow but I said it at the outset here that I think it's like ripe for the plucking um, in the following sense that if you look at what central banks do, first of all, you know, they are given the job of managing the macro economy. It's a big job. What is that job? To maintain price stability, operational price stability around about 2%, to keep the economy at full employment so if it starts to overheat, they tighten monetary policy. If the economy starts to flag, they try to stimulate the economy with interest rate cuts and maybe even QE. They also have a job of maintaining financial stability. And the financial stability part is very important because when you think about, we've mentioned monetary policy many times. How does monetary policy work? Well, monetary policy is essentially the 17 people at the FOMC uh, meeting eight or ten times a year, whatever it is, sit around a room, a, a boardroom for two days and decide on some parameter, shift some parameter. And then somehow everything works. Now, how does it work? Um, we talked about the federal funds rate before. The federal funds rate, in some sense, is the most important and the least important financial <laughs> price in the economy. It's the most important because that's what moves monetary policy. And everything else in, in the financial system, the yield curve, equity prices, exchange rates, through kind of indirect arbitrage relationships, kind of incorporate changes in the federal funds rate. It's le least important in the sense that it's just the overnight rate at which banks lend their balances at the Federal Reserve to one another. <laughs> so it's like overnight, disconnected directly from the rest of the economy, and yet somehow it has this power. So monetary policy works through the financial system through the banking system and through financial markets. And then the physical system, and then, ultimately. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. there's like a three-stage process. First of all, these central bankers get together in a room, you know, every month or couple of months, and they decide on how to turn a knob. Do we, turn, do we leave it? Leave the knob? They have two knobs. One is essentially the interest rate. The other is the size of the balance sheet. And the decision is, do we leave those knobs where they are? Do we turn them a bit in one direction or turn them a bit in the other direction? And then do we signal to the markets the so-called forward guidance or communication about what we're thinking about the future? It's pretty like simple stuff, right? Um, everything else happens through financial markets and through the banking system, etc. So, so that's kind of, oh, that's like a little bit Wizard of Oz-ish there, right? Now getting back to the AI point, so when, when the Fed... What does the Fed do? Gets together. Essentially, it has a objective. Full employment, price stability, and financial stability. It then has a couple of tools that it can use or knobs that it can use to try to help it achieve those objectives. But in order for that to happen, it needs it has a model and it's literally a model, huge general equilibrium dynamic stochastically, stochastic general equi equilibrium model of the economy. And they use this model to say, well, okay, we have all this data. That's the other thing that's happening. Data's coming in and they're looking at the data. Financial markets are looking at essentially the same data. And they're saying, okay, that implies that we perhaps need to turn our knob. And there's two things here. The model is helping them form a picture of where the economy is probably going, employment and inflation, 
in particular. And then the model also tells them, well, if you turn this knob, we've already taken into account all the feedback mechanisms and the lags involved. Turn this knob this way, six months' time, nine months' time, it should have this effect on the economy. That's all it is. So effectively, Vasant, it's a huge computational problem. <laughs> it's a big data. <laughs> it's a big data. It's a huge computational problem. And then you say to yourself, well, if AI can be trained on every monetary policy decision that's ever been made, it just observes. on all of the yeah. data mm -hmm. that's ever been generated that's relevant to, to central bank monetary policy making, and we keep doing that, couldn't a well-trained AI system, and again, maybe it's 10, 15, 20 years in yeah. the future. Build its own model. Do it all itself. Yeah. Better yeah. than, yeah. with all due respect, the FOMC. And, you know, I think this is a sobering discussion because, you know, and I'm, I've been a central and, bank and, watcher and, and, for and decades. And by the way, Paul, if I may interject, mm. like one of the lessons, one of the key lessons that we've learned in AI is that complex, messy, data-driven, beats intelligent, simple, any day, mm. right? So this this notion that there's a simple sort of model that, you know, underlies intelligence seems not to be the case, right? Mm. That uh, we, we get much better predictions, models, when we actually look at the data and in, in all its complexity and build more complex models, right? So that's sort of where I was going, that maybe yep. in the long run, right, when there's lot, tons of this data, that a machine might actually do much better well, than you know, these the other, 17 people saying, well, let's turn this this way, maybe it'll work that right, way. Exactly. And, and I don't want to sort of uh, slight, you know, the, the talents of these mm. people, but we're guessing yeah, and, yeah. And, and we're building models. And, you know, I, I don't want to put myself out of a job and put all my sort of friends and colleagues in the industry out of a job, but, you know, I think we may be going there because I think about the, the last couple of years as well. We had... Pre-COVID, central bankers and everybody else, economists, were concerned. What were they concerned about? Inflation's too low. What can we do to make sure that inflation is too low in the sense of it's below the 2% target? And again, this strikes many ordinary folks as a bit like funny, like, why would you be worried if inflation's too low? I like falling prices. Well, for the economy as a whole, one person's income you know, out, outlays as another person's income and, you know, right. we, want, we want to have a slightly positive interest rate. But that was the problem. And even during COVID, the, I mean, the Fed did a major review for about two years of its monetary policy strategy and it came out in August 2020. And I don't want to beat up on them too much. They've got a difficult job and they're all very intelligent, hardworking people. But it's a little bit kind of like a disconnect here. COVID hits in February, March 2020. The economy goes into the worst recession ever in recorded history, huge drop in GDP. So that would lead you to suggest, wow, we better have very stimulatory monetary and fiscal policy. And so in August of that year, the framework comes out and they say they tweak it a little bit. They say, we're going to aim for higher inflation now on av uh, average inflation targeting. What they said was, if we've had below inflation target inflation for a while. We're now going to aim for above target to even things out. But the timing was impeccably bad because the next thing that happened was inflation went through the roof. Yeah. Why was that? Very simply, COVID did substantial damage to the supply side of the economy. About 5 million workers disappeared in a few months from the US labor market, 5 million. That's a lot of supply capacity. Mm -hmm. But the fiscal and monetary policy, the money printing through budget deficits and QE helped to bring the economy back very strongly. Too much demand, too much money, chasing not enough goods and services, we got inflation. Now, again, I, I, you know, I missed this. The Fed missed this. Most people missed this. Larry Summers didn't. Kudos to him. A few people didn't. But this was a huge forecasting error by the central banks. We've just lived through and we're still living through the consequences of a massive screw-up in forecasting by the very people that are charged with this job. And, you know, there's not a lot of talk about this. I mean, that was not the topic at Jackson Hole. How do we screw up and how do we do a better job in the future? 
talk about structure, you know, global structural imbalances and various things. So I think there's a real like conversation to be had here because the forecasting error that the Fed and other central banks made was mainly on, in my view, on the supply side. They kind of were assuming, well, the supply side should be unaffected by COVID. So how do we turn the knobs to stimulate demand? Arguably, they didn't get that that wrong. What they got wrong was the fact that there wasn't as much supply capacity anymore. Now, this was not hard to find out. <laughs> and I think, again, it's a kind of behavioral decision-making bias. The Fed has got hundreds of PhDs in economics, econometrics, statistics, and people have devoted their lives to doing this job. But it's mainly a demand management job. They're not usually worried about the supply side because the assumption is in the short term to medium term, A, the supply side doesn't change very much, and B, we, the Fed, the Fed central bank, doesn't have the tools to do anything about it. It's not our job. So they weren't looking there as much as they should have been. So again, I think if you trained an AI, AI you know, version of the FOMC and told it to worry about everything, um, I think it could probably do a pretty, pretty good job. And there's another aspect here, which is getting back to a theme we talked about before, that, that we have this monetary policy and we have fiscal policy. Both of them are important in managing the economy. And yet one of them is assigned to these independent technocrats. The other is left in the political realm. And the question that I would have is, isn't there some way of integrating the two in a better way that's more consistent and more coherent will get better social and economic outcomes than we currently have? Now, the normal repost to that, Vasant, is no, 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 no. Don't go anywhere near fiscal policy. Don't pollute monetary policy with fiscal policy because we know what's going to happen. We take those shackles. That sounds like you, Paul, that sounds like you want to take the shackles off. I don't want to take the shackles off. If you start coordinating monetary and fiscal policy and talking about joint action and communication and cooperation, aren't you opening the Pandora's box to hyperinflation again, what we had in the 20th century from time to time? But again, think of AI. If you put the aggregate demand management aspect of fiscal policy and the financial stability aspects of, 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 fis of, of government policy. And again, these AI, uh, what do you call them, machines, bots, presumably in, have all the financial data and have the whole history of every financial crisis and mm -hmm. you know, they have a lot of, they, they have just by definition far, far superior computational ability and what not, than any you know, random human, no matter how well trained, put it all together, but then make sure you also program the shackles into that, you know, AI right, system. Right. And, and is that what you mean by when you say the right institutional framework? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. right? But, the, you know, I've had this discussion for a while, Vasant, and every time, you know, it's usually ignored. But if it's not, it's like, oh, that would be too dangerous. You know, we've got to keep monitoring fiscal policy separate. But we're learning time and time again, that over reliance on monetary policy and central banks, under the, some, some sort of rosy assumption that we've like, you know, we, we, there are no issues associated with that, you know, um, there are no side effects. This is the best system is, is being proven wrong. No discussion of money at this point would be complete without mm. crypto. Does crypto sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater? Is that the major problem with it? That it's trying to solve a problem that for the most part has been solved reasonably well already? Well, crypto again is, is, is a fascinating area and, you know, I'm not a crypto expert per se, and I'm not like a crypto evangelicist. I'm probably more of a crypto skeptic, just to declare my cards. But I think, you know, it's, it's just, it's fascinating stuff. And you've alluded to one aspect of it, which is that, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto and Bitcoin and all of this stuff happened around the financial crisis. And, you know, there's, there's this whole stre stream, you know, in the crypto world of distrust of central banking, distrust of banks, centralized banking. 
distrust of the centralized government and the idea of democratizing money. Um, and, you know, we kind of, we, crypto, cryptocurrencies uh, sort of, you know, be, and again, the, the word trust is interesting because a lot of the people who in the crypto space argue that we can't trust the central banks, we can't trust the government, we can't trust the banks. So we have financial crises, we have these inflation shocks, kind of screw ups. Um, a lot of people kind of maybe doing rent seeking, in, you know, through this whole financial system. So we don't want a centralized system, and we can actually, we want a decentralized system, but we need a decentralized system that is built on some form of trust. So I think one of the early books on like in this area was something called the trust machine or something like that. But the idea was this, we can actually trust this. The reason we can trust it is because nobody's in control. That kind of counterintuitive <laughs> idea. Right. Um, so it's kind of an interesting philosophical uh, d sort of debate. But a couple of things I would say. One is that um, if you go back to that very basic beginning of well, okay, if these cryptocurrencies are designed or intended or aspire to replace what you might call the sovereign mon monetary system, that is all, all we've talked about today, call it just collectively the kind of the sovereign money monetary system. Um, well, how, how good is it, is it scoring on those three metrics? Is it being used as a unit of account? Well, I think in some virtual worlds you know you can do stuff on the internet in in the virtual world in bitcoin or ethereum or these other uh, coins or cryptocurrencies but it's generally speaking we're still operating in a fiat currency world and that looks like that's going to be true for a long time if not forever um secondly what about medium of exchange again you know you you can in certain virtual worlds and certainly on crypto exchanges transactions are taking place in cryptocurrency but it's it's not, you know, widespread outside of that very narrow space. And what about as a store of value? Well, cryptocurrencies, to d depends what you mean by store of value. When economists talk about money as a store of value, they're talking about a stable store of value. If you had $100 and you're a kind of relatively not well-off person and you want to make sure that you have that $100 of purchasing power in one year's time or two years' time, you don't want to invest in a risky stock. <laughs> you want to keep that money in a stable form. And a lot of people say, well, cryptocurrencies are fantastic stores of value. Look, the price of Bitcoin has gone up and it's also gone down. Supply is fixed. But it's basically yeah. a, a dollar-based risky asset in terms of the, 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 the existing system. So there's nobody, put another way, there's nobody controlling the inflation rate of Bitcoin. Now again, some people might say, well, that's a good thing. We don't want a Federal Reserve. <laughs> we don't want uh, somebody controlling all of this stuff. So it's kind of crypto anarchy kind of world. So I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that in any shape or form the cryptocurrencies will displace or even sort of, you know, upend completely. Right. Now, one of the things you notice... The traditional monetary system. Yeah. But, there's a big but. Did you want to you, say something? Well, I was going to say that, you know, one of the things that you note in your book is that central banks have had their hands full with <laughs> lots of other things, but they've been sort of looking at this, you know, from the corners of their eyes and have now begun mm. to sort well, that's of the but. focus yeah. on it. That's the but. So, so now we have all this discussion about central bank digital currencies. You know, the first few years of the crypto revolution, I think the central banks were kind of you know, looking at it out of the corner of their eye, um, but not really doing too much. And I think the penny dropped with when Facebook launched Libra in particular, which ultimately seems to have really not gone very far, but it was a real wake-up call to the central banks. And now virtually every central bank in the world is look is is either has a prototype or is studying uh, this whole issue of central bank digital currencies, which is you know essentially having a a digital form of central bank money, you know, potentially on a blockchain. So what's the difference between that, Paul? Like a digital form well, versus really, like a banknote, well, right? This is, which this is, is a where liability. it gets really fascinating because, and it gets back to this fact that. The, the system that we have at this point of time is a product of history and lessons learned and technology. And as we learn more and we want to 
like solve problems. Like we don't want a financial crisis. We don't want big inflations. We don't want the bottom falling out of the economy. And as technology progresses, there are new opportunities. So if you go back to that central bank balance sheet, from a, yeah, from a private sector point of view, there are two liabilities on the bank, central bank's balance sheet. One is those reserves. That's digital money, which is only issued to commercial banks. And then there is banknotes, which uh, paper money, which is issued to anybody, particularly the man and woman in the street. So you ask the question, why is it that one form of central bank liability, money, which is digital, is the prerogative of the banking system, but if, if the average you know, Joe or Mary in the street, uh, they can hold paper claims on the central bank. Yeah. Or even not, electronic, like for all practical digital. purposes. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so one is digital and the other is paper slash electronic. Well, I'm, the electronic bit though is if, you know, when people use their mobile phones yeah, yeah, and yeah. whatnot right, right. Uh, and wallets, right. they're actually moving money between bank accounts. Right. That's still paper money, right? It's just sort of moving in electronic form, well, isn't yeah, it? It's, so yeah. it's, it's money, it, but yeah. it's, it's still going through the banking system. So, so the point is, this what cryptocurrency revolution and the blockchain revolution and tokenized money and all the stuff which is way above my level of understanding and pay grade, but it's completely opened up a new innovation technological frontier. And then when you look at the banking system and the central banks and everything as it's operating now, it's like it's almost looking a little bit like a dinosaur, like an anachronism. So the obvious you know, pressure on central banks is and particularly as the demand for cash itself, banknotes itself, is generally in decline, to say, well, why, don't, why doesn't the Fed issue a digital version, a tokenized version or something that's sitting on a, a, a permissioned blockchain to the general public? Of, of the banknote. Instead of the bank, bank no, you can yeah. still keep oh, the, the bank notes, right, right. But, but why can't... It's one or the other. Yeah. You, you or, can... you know, why... So that's kind of like... And that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's a whole lot of... I mean, you don't even need a blockchain for that, right? You I mean, it's probably just, don't. It's just like you, you take paper money and yeah. you convert it into a, a, a digital form. Uh, what are the implications of that? Is that well, something hundreds, that they're trying to sort through? Well, it, it? Exactly. I mean, and everybody. I mean, the Fed, I mean, every major central bank, the BIS, I mean, IMF, you name it. I mean, there's like hundreds and hundreds of pages of reports have come out on this. So are, are, are some of the concerns that there could be a different form of a run on a bank? Well, that's a big concern. So so basically the mindset of the bank, of the central banks, the very conservative institutions. So they're saying, well, we need to embrace new technologies. So we need to, and if they don't do it, they kind of know that they got the wake up It'll call. It'll get done. It'll get done by somehow, somebody else. Yeah. So they better, because the banks, central banks, one of their roles, again, not not that sexy and, and not that well understood, is that they are responsible for the payment system, the, you know, the, the settlement system. Everything ultimately in the economy, every transaction ultimately, indirectly, is settled in central bank money. Those reserves, they play an important role not just in monetary policy, but in the whole flow of money payment through system. the, the mm. payment system. So gee, if, if there's a new technology which is revolutionizing potentially the payment system, that's the central bank's job to do something about. So what are they worried about? So the sort of mindset, I think, as I perceive it, Vasan, is, well, we need to you know, be alert, we need to sort of innovate and adapt, but we don't want to upset the apple cart. Now, what is the apple cart? One is financial stability concerns. The concern is that, well, if... At the moment, you have your digital wallet and you sort of pay everything with your digital wallet, which is probably on your mobile phone, and money is going between all these bank accounts. And then those things are being settled at the central bank through the reserve accounts. Why not just have digital cash, a direct claim on the central bank? Well, one reason is, well, now you've disintermediated the banking system. Why would you be worried about that? Well... From one side of the balance sheet, maybe you're not too worried about that. I mean, the right-hand side, the liability side, it's just a payments mechanism. It doesn't really matter. You wouldn't even notice, right. frankly speaking. But why do banks exist in the first place? 
banks go back to that to initial money. credit. <laughs> they cr- they <laughs> create money, money. Yeah. but they're creating credit, and they're doing a heck of a lot in terms of of evaluating. You know, the riskiness yeah. and the riskiness and the value. Is this a good project? Do we want the Fed doing all of that? Of course not. So that's one thing they're worried about. There's been sort of this disintermediation out of the banking system. Now, again, I think there are ways of, of, of coping with that. Maybe the role of banks evolves and they do that stuff in a more specialized way, kind of securitizing stuff very quickly, you know, whatever. So financial stability is one. Another one is kind of this uh, prism of or lens of, well, how would this affect our ability to operate monetary policy? Right? How would it sort of potentially complicate or interfere with that? Um, so they're worrying about that a lot. They're also worrying about you know, cyber risk. Uh, they're worried about you know, privacy and surveillance state. And one of the things that's kind of... Kind of interesting. Coming back to the Leviathan. Coming back right? to the Leviathan. Yeah. And, you know, money is deeply political, personal, sovereign. You know, it's, it's, it's what's really kind of somewhat surprised me. I don't know if you noticed this, Vasant, is that this CBDC discussion, which is still at a kind of relatively early stage, has already become very politicized. Tip, it's sort of more along the left-right spectrum, but there are a lot of people who are, you know, maybe it's more, I don't know, alt-media or maybe it's even Ron DeSantis, one of the leading Republican candidates for president, came straight out and said first thing he would do is squash this whole CBDC. So it's being looked upon with a lot of suspicion from certain quarters probably including the crypto anarchists and you know the people that have you know you have this streak in american history of distrust of central authority and wall street and washington and all this sort of stuff so that's going to be another thing that you know will have to be navigated that how do the central banks cope with that wider social scrutiny about what they're doing but i do think also and apropos of that point that the CBDC discussion, its central bank digital currency, is much potentially a much broader discussion than just central banks and monetary policy. You know, where are the fiscal authorities in this? Where is the government? Because once you get like CBDC becoming, and it's you know, once you get this concept of programmable money, for example, now this scares the living daylights out of some people. You know, you could have all kinds of uh, things programmed into that. Um, but it gives the ability of, if you go back to this, one of the basic points of my book is that, look, governments, they don't need to borrow money. They can create money. But they'll have to do it in the right way. You know, potentially, this CBDC, this, you know, direct digital money which is going to people could be used as a tool of fiscal policy more than monetary policy. It's a way of injecting and potentially withdrawing, depending on the situation, money into the economy, but doing it in a much more optimized way. And the problem with monetary policy, it's a very indirect way of influencing aggregate demand through the financial system. And more and more people are worrying about the fact that it seems to favor the rich. Um, And typically, even in a recession, the rich don't need more money. It's the poor that need more money. But what happens in a recession? People lose their jobs. And it's usually the poorer people lose their jobs. So wouldn't you want in a recession a way of very quickly and effectively getting purchasing power into the hands of the people who are going to spend it the most effectively? So we're having a very fiscal policy discussion and yet all of the CBDC discussion is like a monetary policy yeah, and yeah. central banking discussion. Again, yeah, I think this yeah. is disconnect. Fascinating. You know, I, I was listening to a um, discussion on digital public infrastructure in India, mm. you know, which implemented this biometric system and they talked about how the system was repurposed during COVID. It was, the, they, they called it a direct benefits transfer right. system, you know, to get money into people's accounts. And during COVID, it p- pivoted really easily into putting money into people's accounts instantly, mm. right? But in India, there's sort of more of a, 
concerned that this is that the government could be a despotic leviathan, right? That that there aren't enough controls and shackles. So so there are those sort of concerns mm. there. But I can see that these would be serious issues when you move to a digital currency. I think we're getting to a brave new world. We, we really are. We really are. You know, Paul, it would be fascinating to have this conversation in five years. <laughs> Hopefully both of us are still around, you know, to see where things go. But this has been fascinating. There's so much ground we've covered here. You know, I just uh, learned a huge amount by reading your book. And uh, it's been fascinating have the, having this uh, conversation, Paul. So thanks Thank so you, much Vata. for your time. It's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. But uh, we'll do this again. Mm. Uh, you know, Thanks for coming on the show again, but we will do it again and see where we are in five years. It'll be fascinating. Fantastic. I'll put that in my diary. Awesome. <laughs> Good stuff, Paul. Thanks again. <laughs>